All right. So I'll start on this side. I'll go back to the um, picture so we can all see the picture that you're sharing. So we have, we're going to start with this one. And what, what have you to say about this image? Um, okay, so the, uh, the obvious message here, right, is that the uh, federal government is uh, standing behind the integration of public education. Um, and the public education, right, is uh, the back wall there that's clearly um, been, uh, been tainted and even just vandalized by this one um, mentality. Um, and these people in front of them, the figures, are, you know, walking past that with a lot of dignity, a lot of integrity. Um, and then, do you want to you talk about the dress? Sure. Um, <laughs> we mentioned that because she's wearing a white dress in particular, like, um, I said that maybe white could portray a sense of innocence. Um, but then also showing that she has to dress up and put her very best self forward. Just her whitest self. Forward. Yeah, her whitest self forward to try and to try and fit in with this white um, society. Um, and then I also mentioned uh, the formation in which the men are walking, that they're sort of um, in a protective stance and that they're, they're boxing her in, um, like just sort of keeping her protected. Um, and then the fact that they have no heads means it's not really an individualized kind of situation. It's, or that's how you can interpret it. One way to interpret it is that like these can be, these can and will be, you know, federal, if it has to be this way, federal guards in Ohio, federal guards in New Jersey, across the nation, because this is happening. You know, it's being um, enforced. Okay. What do you think about the title? The problem we all live with. Yeah, I have no idea. Um, it kind of appeals to particularly, I think, the, the white people who view like the blacks integrating uh, with their, their school as the issue. So it sort of maybe is meant to appeal specifically to them, being uh, like titling this portrait with a mentality that they can relate to, but then the portrait itself is showing, look, like we're protecting this idea. So maybe it's like a, a drawing. Okay. And of the five that I distributed, this is clearly the most political. And by virtue of being the most political, it might be then the one most, you know, sort of, you could say that this is propaganda, because again, propaganda is that which is to be put forward. Well, what is to be put forward is the idea that we got a problem here, and that this, you know, governmental protection of a young innocent child is is what we got to do to deal with the problem. And again, he's publishing these illustrations in national publications for a national audience, and there are probably some sections of the nation which wouldn't be happy with the picture, and probably were no longer fans of Norman Rockwell, based upon this image. Anything to add from anybody else in the class about it? The title really makes me uh, think about how uh, the this uh, segregation and the labeling, so it kind of like divides because the people that would most likely be consuming this medium are were probably white, mm -hmm. um, and they would see as the the problem is integration, the integration of the schools. So they would think that a lot of people would have thought that it's a problem. And then uh, um, I think it's really interesting how we all ha can have two meanings because it can it, one person can think that we um, would be like white people, that, that the integration is a problem and that we is thinking of dividing, but we all is could also mean that as like the entire country, you know, all races. So I think it's really interesting how the title um, can like lead people to have <coughs> different perspectives on it. Okay. And Imagine the Facebook comment section. If this was this was on Facebook, like in when in the time that it was, you know, in the news, you know, 
just like imagine what people would be saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it's I think it's really interesting um, that the girl is walking in the same position as the four men that are surrounding her. Uh -huh. like the right hand forward and the yeah. left arm straight down. Um, so I don't I don't know what if, what that means if that if that means that she's trying to uh, mimic the people protecting her and, and trying to be more like them or um, she if she's like just trying right? to if she's just trying to integrate in every way possible and, and be like everyone else. Mm. Okay, it's an interesting insight. In terms of visual composition, designers talk about the craft principles. Contrast, repetition, alignment, and proximity. Repetition is something that we like in paintings. We like it in websites. We like it in design. So basically, if you've got an image or a shape and you repeat that shape somewhere else, that satisfies us. So this is, we've got repetition is going on there from a design perspective, but again, there's the possibility of interpreting it as this little girl is replicating the exact posture and form of her protectors, so then there's the whole socio-psychological aspect of what it means. And again, we're looking at a picture, we, a picture we take and we take in all at once, and now what we're doing is mode switching, we are crafting stories about the picture because this picture is telling us a story. James? Does it look like that tomato is a snail to anybody? Oh, I see <laughs> it. Kind of see. See. I didn't see it before. Oh, yeah. and, and now what will happen is I will never not be able to see <laughs> that <laughs> as a snail. Well, okay. It doesn't look kind of like a snail though. It does. It looks a lot like a snail. Because a couple of, th I mean, you see the antenna and yeah, everything. Like, right? Do you yes. think that's like purposely there to like <laughs> say like the, the, the rate of progress at which people are being integrated in? It could well be. It could it well be. That's, that's excellent. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Any other comments on this one? All right. Let us go then to the next one up here. So we've got, I couldn't find, I, I found this, um, uh, four years ago when Dr. Ambrose and I first taught this course and uh, there's a Norman Rockwell site and so this has the watermark on it, Rockwell, so I'm pretty sure I got it from there but I couldn't, I could not get back to it and I couldn't find the name of it and I searched swimming hole and varieties of other things so it's the, the title of it is Sweet Memories Sweet Memories, mm -hmm. okay excellent um, and just for future reference you can reverse image search okay. the, the picture and it'll pop up um, but yeah we so one of the first things that we noticed was how how vibrant the colors are in in this particular painting and how um, it kind of shows like it it shows kind of the the sadness of the change but also like the, the beauty of what's to come as well um, and then we we talked about how um, the he kind of shows how the girls are. You can interpret it as the girls being ob obedient and just following along and doing what they're told, or you could interpret it as the girls uh, wanting to learn as much as they can because they know that they are going to be just handed um, a lot of wealth of knowledge in their life. Um, and then you want to? Yeah, I think it just speaks to the stereotypes. Uh, you know, like boys are kind of like playing catch up on, on uh, you know, not really, but like just kind of letting their lives you know, everybody else pushed them through what the education, you know, experience. And so they're like enjoying their last few seconds of summer, you know, because they they know they're going to have to go back, but like they might as well like not care about it until the second they're there, you know. So and then I thought that it was something there's something to be said about the fact that you, with the girls, there seems to be two girls who are right next to each other, and it looks like one of them even has her arm behind the other one. Um, and then the little girl following. Uh, and then the same thing with the boys. The two older ones are like kind of latched onto each other, or at least the middle one is latched onto the oldest one. And then the youngest one is kind of there lugging something along with him. I don't know. I don't know what it means, but... <laughs> Is it, do you think it's trafficking in stereotypes about the relationship of boys to school and the girls to school? Or is it just basically illustrating truths? Um, I, think it, I think it's more illustrating truths than it is it depends on your the, the stereotypes. Um, yeah, it's a good stereotype. <laughs> I think it's a stereotype, but I think it's true in some respect. Okay. And I think it's also another another thing is that it kind of shows how 
Um, not not perfect. The system of schooling is and was at that time that the boys would rather be outside uh, playing than they would inside learning about the world and such. Okay. And when we first started talking about Rackwell, some people were praising him for his like photorealism. And so certainly this one here has a certain photorealism, whereas this one is much more impressionistic. Yeah. And so I would want to kind of go back and look at the dates on them and see if we're looking at a progress in Rockwell becoming more photorealistic, or maybe this was a later one, I'm not sure. Any other comments from anybody on this one? And what was the name of it again? Sweet Memories. Sweet Memories. All right, let us move on to, I think it's Happy Birthday Teacher. <laughs> yeah. All right, so, Oh, uh, we interpret this pretty similarly, and um, clearly the focus, well, to us, the focus of the picture is on the teacher, um, and that can be seen really a lot in her proportion in the picture, and how she is much uh, taller than the children, and she's the only one whose face we see in the picture. Yeah, and this this shows, I mean, sidewise, it draws our eye to that, but also even above her, um, we, we have red highlights and they draw our eye up to the flag at the top, which is the American flag, and the red, white, and blue in the picture, I mean, there's some blue shirts and a red shirt and a white shirt. Um, it's, it's very um, pro-American, which makes sense because she's commissioned by an American magazine, so, I mean, and going back to the teacher and the student's respect for her, um, I mean, there's an apple on the desk, which is a symbol of, you know, respect for your teacher, and um, it seems like the students are really looking up to her, literally. Right, and it's like the hierarchy of the students at the bottom being like the lower class um, in this economic system. Well, like no, almost I mean, like, well, plus mm -hmm. economic, maybe we can go back to like, yeah, you know, like what you said about their learning but take. Right, but the, p the point is that they're at the bottom looking up to the teacher, and then you have the flag sticking up a little bit above her, so it's kind of this hierarchy of nationalism and how we respect education. Um, so yeah. Okay, and one of the one of the criticisms that some people make of Rockwell is that he's got this, you know, sentimental past that was it was never really like that. And what he does is he draws this idealistic sentimental past, which is you know tremendously happy. And again, that can be something that is you know uh, a value of his art and to his audience. His audience looks at this and it's like, wow, I, I feel good about that teacher. I remember when I was a kid and we had this teacher. We really liked Mrs. Jones, et cetera. Were you going to say something, Vivian? Yeah, I think it's also just the, um, it's interesting uh, about uh, the, the portrayal of the teacher, you know, um, because she's so, um, first of all, she's clearly pretty, right? She's clearly pretty and she's very feminine, you know, her posture is very um, gracious. And um, yeah, and I think also just the whole um, that she's holding her coat, you know, it's like a, it really uh, portrays this relationship with her students that I think is not, you know, some, I mean, maybe, but I think it's harder to come by uh, that sort of close relationship with your students. Um, so yeah, like uh, Rockwell portraying these sort of like ideal you know, uh, situations. Okay. Yeah. Thank um, you. So we discussed um, the gender bias of the teacher being a female um, and how that contrasts with the students being both male and female. Um, but we interpreted the teacher, and it may, it's maybe because we can see the picture better, but she's actually kind of plain looking and not a very attractive woman um, to, to us. I'm, I don't know how to, that's kind of weird. But, um, <laughs> I don't think you're offending anybody. 
Um, it's kind. Of, we we talked. We noticed like the differences between the masculinity and femininity of the students. How I noticed the boy it kind of seems to be like a class clown with a eraser on his head, and the girls have bows in their hair, so they're more feminine. Also, I noticed that the girl in the middle front seems to be the same, well, at least to me, seems to be the same girl in the picture of the, the girl with the black eye. And you can see how her hair is like undone in the girl with the black eye, but she's wearing the same, and like when her hair's together. Yeah, anyways, I think it's the same girl. So I thought okay. that was interesting. Any other comments on that one? All right, so this might be, you know, particularly, you know, sentimental, benign, happy picture. It's her birthday, the students seem to genuinely like her, and then here we have a rather <laughs> different image of school. So what have you to say to this? <laughs> um, okay. Uh, we, oh, we're, well, we're not very good at art at all. Um, but when we're looking at the picture, we kind of notice that there's a lot of different details in here that promote like the idea of authority in education. Um, the fact that he can cane a student is uh, it shows like how education has evolved in like the the rules, not rules, but laws, I guess, mm. of, of schooling. Um, you can't kids anymore in school, um, as well as the fact that he seems to be on a stage, and he's also depicted as the bigger character. Um, I talk about the colors. Yeah, the colors are kind of like dark and a little depressing, and what else? Oh, um, and the kids are just like watching. Some look like they're enjoying it. Like the one on the left, he looks like he's. Yeah. yeah. He looks really creepy in that picture on the board. Yeah, but, but the one we have, he looks like he's enjoying. He's kind of smiling his and get caned. And um, then the other ones are kind of just like, oh wow. Yeah, the girls seem to be kind of hidden and um, afraid. Just. There's one, I don't know if you can see her, but she's kind of under the cape of the teacher. She kind of looks like she's hiding behind the book, but her face expresses like interest as well. So we don't know if that's just like the idea that they are younger and the maturity hasn't kicked in at, at all. And some of the girls seem more poised, which would also go with the idea that some that girls do mature faster versus the little boy on the side who's like, I'm gonna watch and I'm excited. Okay. And there's a, a nursery rhyme, girls are made of sugar and spice and everything nice, and boys are made from snakes and snails and puppy dog tails. So what we, again, we've got these sort of uh, stereotypes of the difference between males and females for school-age students. And females are obedient, cooperative, and you know, teacher's pet, and the boys are just trouble. Uh, they don't want to be there. And again, this is Tom Sawyer. So this is from a an illustrated edition of Tom Sawyer. So Norman Rockwell is contracted by a book publisher. This would be you know many years after Mark Twain has passed away, but a book publisher is publishing this novel, which has it in an episode where Tom gets a caning, and so then he's presenting this. And so to some people now, today's sensibilities, in which most states you're not allowed to use cap uh, corporal punishment in public schools, some people might be horrified by this, but at the time that Mark Twain wrote uh, Tom Sawyer, this was kind of normal. And even at the time when Norman Rockwell painted this, there was probably in many more states in which corporal punishment was allowed. And it's still allowed in some states in public school, and it's still allowed in private schools. So basically, you know, the kids who don't behave, if you beat them, then, then the question is, what do you get? What you get is possibly uh, a damaged child is going to end up being a mass murderer, but you know, he's going he's to behave in that history class. Um, I was watching uh, a documentary about Trevor Noah, the guy who took over for John Stewart on The Daily Show, yeah. um, and he's from South Africa. Um, and so he was talking about um, this whole thing that happened with the school that Oprah um, started.
started in South Africa where um, she came and it was sort of this like magnificent thing and it's, you know she was um, she was really uh, promoting the education of girls and you know all this great stuff um, and then the way that Trevor Noah describes it is that she came and she did everything great except for she put South African teachers in charge right so then she left and there was this whole crisis because then there is, you know, there is like news of Oprah's school teachers beating all of these students mm -hmm. and all this stuff like that. So it's, yeah, it's uh, not clearly not just an American custom, but yeah. it is like, it definitely seems more pre prevalent um, in private private school. Courses. Well, what happens is, in in general, basically. The teachers operate in what's called in loco parentis, in the place of the parent. And then in many states, in the public schools, they said, well, even if the parent beats the kids at home, you're not allowed to beat the kids in the school. But once you go to a private school, basically those parents are handing the child over to those private educators and say, okay, here's, here's the deal. So um, it's, a, it's a much more controversial topic today in America than it was probably either when, and we lost our projection, what does that mean? Oh, it's blinking red. Yeah, it went into the So it'll eventually come back. Twenty <laughs> seconds or so. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. So we will not have the benefit of looking. Okay. Anybody have? Anybody else have any comments on the caning? Anybody? Well, um, I think it speaks to the difference in education systems. Like back then. Uh, the teachers completely control the classroom, so they don't care about if the students respect them or not, they just want the students to listen. And now it's more about the students having equal respect in the classroom. Okay. So the whole notion of authority and power in an educational situation is changing. Um, and so I'm happy that I went to, I went to, a, I had eight years of parochial school before I had four years of Jesuit priests, and I never got beaten. And there wasn't a lot of beating either by the nuns or the priests in my grade school, but I knew people who did get whooped, and uh, I'm I'm happy to say they never had to whoop me. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> when the projector comes back on, we're going to see. Let me let me uh, just remind. So this is the one, and it's called the Shiner. And so what we have is a young woman, and indeed she could be the very same one who was in the front of the class in Happy Birthday to Mrs. Jones. Um, and she's outside the principal's office. She has an obvious black eye, and she also has a big grin on her face. So what have you to say about the Shiner? Uh, well, we said that like the first assumption that you make when you see the photo or the drawn painting is that the girl was most likely in a fight and she won, and then her mom was called to the principal's office to discuss it with the principal. But we said it could also be the teacher or the secretary. secretary. Yeah. And yeah. then um, we said that, well, James brought up that that it probably might not, that could not be the case. Like she could have just tripped or she just got injured and had nothing to do with it. And it doesn't necessarily have to be about her about getting in a fight. fight. <laughs> she could have got hit with like a ball or something. But I think the, the kind of narrative that we kind of agreed upon, right? Was that like children always like have this outlook of like wanting to like have fun regardless of the inherent danger in any like given situation, and so like children thrive off of like being like unrestricted, and like in the in the painting you can kind of see like the expression and like the manner at which like the principal and the whoever the woman is are like composing themselves. It kind of gives the idea that like um, they they kind of like don't really realize that like children need that like like unrestricted like atmosphere even though there's like an element of like there's, it, there's a compromise to like their safety and we notice that like there's a bunch of like little things that could be interpreted uh, in various ways throughout the painting like if you look at like the principal's shoes and like the, the girl's shoes, the principal's feet are like very square and the on plane on the ground. While the obviously the girl's shoes are kind of just kind of like mm -hmm. cocked her ankles up. Untied. Yeah, untied, not very orderly. 
Um, if you look at like the top left corner, you can see like the bulletin board is very orderly, like everything's nothing to skew at all. And then there's like a little picture of two two girls, they're very colorful and they look very happy. Are they holding hands? Uh, they, yeah, they're kind of holding hands. So it says like the picture could be like the idealized yeah. version of what children should be, and then this girl's like kind of the opposite in the picture. Um, I think another thing we looked at was there's like a big filing cabinet that's in the in the same like part of the the, the view as the principal and the secretary or mom or whoever. Um, and we said that that could be like representative of like how bureaucracy changes some sort of mindset about the freedoms and liberties that children should have in public education or education in general. Okay. But then uh, speaking to like the, the audience perspective, when they see this painting, they're like, oh, I was that child, or, or they know that child, and then or they're like from the parents or principal's perspective and like, oh, I have that child. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments from anybody about the picture? If if the one where the girls are dutifully going off to school and the boys are dragging back is sort of tra traffic in, in gender stereotypes, this might be doing just the opposite. So basically, instead of having the well-behaved girl, this girl seems obviously pleased as punch with herself. <laughs> and she is, not only has a black eye, now here's a, a bandage on her knee, and she's totally disheveled. So this could be evidence that Rockwell did not just have stereotypical views about males and females, uh, school-aged children. All right, I want to show one other video that's in the module called, uh, I think it's called Popular Depictions, Depictions of School, and it's one from the Blues Brothers movie, and it is The Penguin. Chicken Elwood. Come in. Hello, boys. Nice to see you. Please. here in front of me. I want to see your faces. <laughs> the county took a tax assessment of this property last month. They want $5,000. Doesn't the church have to pay that? would if they were interested in keeping the place, but they aren't. The Archbishop wants to sell this building outright to the Board of Education. What's going to happen to you? I'll be sent to the missions. Forget it. Five grand, no problem. We'll have it for you in the morning. Let's go, Ellen. No, no. I will not take your filthy stolen money. Well, then. I guess you really have shit creek. <laughs> I beg your pardon, what did you say? I offered to help you. Mm -hmm. You refused to take our money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I said, I guess you really have shit creek. Christ, Jake, take it easy, man. Oh, shit. Oh, Jesus. Oh, shit. <laughs> you are such a disappointing pair. I prayed so hard for you. It saddens and hurts me that the two young men whom I raised to believe in the Ten Commandments have returned to me as two thieves with filthy mouths and bad attitudes. <laughs> Get out, and don't come back until
until you've redeemed yourselves. <laughs> what? <laughs> I love right. the giant cruises. Yeah. 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 All right. So basically, we've got you know various depictions of education, educational settings. Um, most of us, or all of us, were laughing at these nuns beating these these you know people, and yet you know. We shouldn't be laughing at that. That's not funny, and yet it's hysterical. So w there's one theory about humor that humor relies upon somebody getting hurt. You know, so even if it's innocent humor where there's just a simple un misunderstanding, it's like somebody else's pain, and because it's not us, we can kind of laugh at it. So the fact that it was Jake and Elwood taking a beating rather than any of us, we can laugh at it. But again, this notion of the use of force and the use of violence to promote learning is uh, a rather controversial topic. So Dr. Ambrose, would you like to? I'll just follow up a little bit on, on this theme of control and authoritarianism and violence or the lack thereof. Uh, you can pretty much put schools on a continuum from complete freedom to absolute no, absolutely no freedom at all. Like the, the school that these guys were in seemed to be quite authoritarian. Um, but then the typical public school somewhere in the middle, and then some some charter schools and private schools are very freedom-inducing, and others are not. Others are quite authoritarian, uh, where they control the kids as if, as if they're in a concentration camp. And then uh, you can go the opposite direction, where there are schools that provide a lot more freedom and some of them are really effective, and some of them are, are completely complete disasters. An example of a complete disaster freedom school is Summerhill in Britain. It started several decades ago with the philosophy of letting the kids decide what, what's to be done. So the kids decide on what they're going to do every day. Um, and it just completely fell flat because the kids decided they're just going to play all day. <laughs> They didn't learn anything. Uh, there was no control. There was no uh, curriculum of any sort. But then there's another school that provides a lot of freedom that's really effective. And that one is uh, the Roper School in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. It was started by two Holocaust survivors uh, who came to America after Hitler invaded Austria. And they, they were so um, damaged by, by what happened over in Europe, that they wanted to start a school system that would ensure that uh, totalitarian would, totalitarianism would never arise again. So their philosophy in that school was very student-centered, um, giving a lot of autonomy and power to the kids, but not complete power. So there are teachers, there are administrators, uh, but they, they push decision-making to the kids whenever they can the extent possible without giving away the whole store. So you will you walk into that school, wander around in the classrooms from K through 12, and you'll see the kids having a lot of decision-making power to the point where they get to decide a lot of what they do, not everything, but a lot. They have interest-based curriculum. So if a kid is interested in robotics, that kid is going to have a lot of time during the school year to explore robotics but we'll still have to learn the three R's and a few other things. Um, but you'll also find kids in that school in important uh, committees. Like if there's a hiring committee for a new teacher or a new principal, there will likely be a sixth grader on it. Mm. And the sixth grader will have a vote. <laughs> and we'll be able to ask questions at the interviews. It, it, it's very interesting. So the kids tend to come out of there um, really autonomous and purposeful. They also have a strong sense of ethics because they work on that a lot. <coughs> okay, uh, one thing to get into before we're done tonight is um, inquiry learning in schools. Uh, in inquiry, there's a whole lot of different models of teaching and learning. Um, the models have to do with uh, setting up learning in certain ways, and they're usually step by step. And one core model is the inquiry model. It has several steps that you follow, but it's designed based on the scientific method. Anybody want to take a stab at describing the scientific method to us? This is your 
<laughs> okay. Okay. Great. Well, you start with a question. So you wonder something, want an answer to something. Then you come up with a hypothesis, which is like an educated guess on what you think the answer might be. And then you design an experiment to test your hypothesis. And then you look at the, your results and analyze them and see like, if what you saw in your experiment supports what you originally thought or if it refutes it. And then right. Glad we have scientists in here because I have no idea what scientists meant it. <laughs> Here's how the model works. Um, <clears throat> this is kind of a description of how the scientific method has been translated into a teaching process. I'll just let you read that. So um, there's a little clip here that will show you some discrepant events or puzzling situations. So this is hydrogen and oxygen. Yes. Okay? Yeah. So now scoop up some of those bubbles. Uh -huh. That's perfect, right? So now I'm just going to light them on fire. Watch. <laughs> So if by accident, it's not, oh, this is like a little fire. <laughs> <laughs> that was bad. Oh my God. Isn't that amazing? Most people don't say that. Again, I mean kids. Hey, watch this. See that moment there turns into a starch? Seven feet long, three feet wide, about two feet deep. There's 2,500 pounds of cornstarch in here. Just go really, really fast, ready? Go, 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 events. They're, they're designed to get kids interested in what's happening so that they will naturally hypothesize and create an educated guess and then figure out a way to test their hypotheses. Now that's normally thought of as a, in the sciences you learn that, but you can create discrepant events for other <coughs> subject areas and topics. You might be able to do it for music. I don't know enough about music to figure this out. Maybe you can. But I'm going to show you one that has to do with history, and I'm going to ask you to play with it. Here's a discrepant event for history and geography. I'm hoping you see something wrong with this map. Here we're pretending that continental drift, the idea that the continents flowed around uh, very, very, very slowly throughout uh, the eons, and they end up in different places. Like if you look at South America, 
and Africa, South America fits into it. That's because they were joined at one time. So the, the Americas have been drifting westward. Here we're pretending that North America drifted further westward and tipped sideways. So that now Alaska is down on the equator, <laughs> that New York and New Jersey are up in the far <laughs> northern region, getting close to the Arctic region, that northern Canada, the islands of northern Canada, are in the temperate zone, not very far from Asia. Canadians really like this scenario because <laughs> these Arctic wasteland islands are really productive now. <laughs> um, so the question is, how would history have been different if world geography had been like this when humans came onto the planet first time? If you'd break into teams and hypothesize about that, generate some possibilities, that, that historical possibilities, and also what things would be like now if this were the case. Let's take five minutes or so to do that. 